Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and welcome to our uh, um, series review. Today we will uh, review the uh, we'll have the innovation uh, series where uh, we are going to review some of the uh, best books out of the first 50 books that we have reviewed in um, uh, innovation and change. The books we have chosen out of the 50 books that we will uh, we have reviewed is, of course, the Innovators Dilemma by Chris Tansen. Um, the uh, Switch by Chip and Dan Heath, uh, Lean Startup by Eric uh, Rees, Thinking Skills and Edward De Bono Six Thinking Hats, and also the Gestalt uh, Therapy. Um, so the uh, session today, the workshop is going to be split into four uh, sections. What is the definition of innovation? Uh, is there a process for innovation and how do we um, uh, define the innovation process, challenges for uh, creating change and innovation, and then some tools for creative thinking uh, to enable out-of-the-box thinking and also uh, the um, uh, creative and analytical thinking skills that are required for uh, innovation. So let's start by the first section, what is innovation and how is innovation different from uh, the creativity and from invention? So let's define the three terms, creativity, invention, and innovation. So basically, creativity is when something, someone creates something from scratch and turn it into a reality. So it's very important. Sometimes people think creativity is just thinking outside the box, but actually without turning something into reality, neither creativity nor innovation is, um, uh, is achieved. Both creativity and innovation depend on the reality uh, side. Only invention is something that re relates to the concept alone. So when we are talking about creativity and innovation, it's very important that both of them depend on turning something into reality. Creativity is something that you start from absolute zero, which is like something uh, like, and we will discuss this in a moment, uh, uh, is when you create something that was not there. So the first uh, uh, phone, uh, Graham Bell, um, uh, the first uh, uh, bulb, uh, Tesla, the first electricity. So that's creativity. Innovation is when you turn uh, the concept, the, the, the something that is already there into um, widespread use. This is when you are using, for example, um, LED uh, TVs and LCDs and all of that. Um, but the TV in itself was creativity and then innovation was the use of new technology in changing the loop um, uh, and changing the product itself into a widely commercial used uh, product. So those are the differences. In order to um, uh, segment uh, all of the um, innovation and creativity uh, categories, there is a very nice uh, grid or matrix, which is um, segmenting the product depending on two factors, whether the product is an incremental improvement or radical improvement. And this is like exactly what we discussed, like incremental improvement is when you turn the TV into LCD and LED. This is incremental. Radical is when you actually introduce the product from the beginning, like the iPhone, for example. Market, depending on disruptive market or sustaining market. Sustaining market is the market that we know, like TV market is sustaining. But what is the disruptive market, for example, is um, uh, the um, uh, conference calls, the Zoom uh, calls, and, and all of the WebEx and all of that when it was introduced in the first time, it was disruptive. Also iPhone, when it was introduced in the first time, it was disruptive. So if we want to categorize, if we want to look into the four boxes, let's then uh, look and, and give some examples. When we look at um, incremental sustaining, that's the easiest one, is when you are progressing and you, know, the, you are um, developing the products as you go, which is like the uh, TV market, the um, from bulb TV into L, uh, into um, uh, the plasma and then into LCD and then LED, that's incrementally sustaining. Nothing there that is really disruptive. When we look at um, um, the 
radically sustaining. So that's significant improvement on a product, but it's an old market. And this is exactly when, uh, for example, iPhone was introduced. So iPhone came over here when it is radically sustaining. So it is a phone at the end of the day. So it did not change the way that telecommunication um, uh, um, is, is, has, is, uh, was there, but it only um, made a radical sustaining to the phone. So it is in the same market, which is um, uh, the, the, the smartphone market, but then it made a radical change because then it was a significant improvement. So um, uh, um, engineer Abu Shawish is, is uh, saying, like the uh, um, you know when us is uh, uh, you know making innovations and the chinese are developing that so um, making changes in that however um, uh, you know this this year we have seen end of 2019 and early 2020 all the challenges about the 5g where the chinese have been able to make one step ahead in terms of the technology over the us technology in terms of the 5g and um, the this is this is this is one of the challenges now that um, disruptive uh, technology uh, is is facing, because there is the, nobody expected China to come with the 5G that quick uh, and also quicker than other uh, uh, competitors as well. Now let's look at the disruptive markets. So disruptive markets, it means that the market segments and the channels have. It have changed significantly when we are um, looking at uh, the uh, um, the the product. So, for example, if we want to look at something that is radically disruptive, yeah, this could be in the um, uh, hyperloop, for example. Uh, uh, so, you know, the hyperloop that is by version. Um, where uh, this is something that was absolutely not expected and it will change the uh, transportation equation across the world because uh, that's a much safer way to travel than airlines, less headache. If this is really going to be applied across the world, people are going to travel via the Hyperloop. Um, you know, for example, uh, the, um, the Hyperloop uh, doesn't have any issues with weather uh, changes like the aircrafts. Uh, you don't have turbulence because of the uh, air um, turbulence, uh, rain, uh, thunders, all of that. You get a much safer and easier travel. So that's a radically disruptive um, uh, uh, change. And this is the, an example of that. What about incrementally disruptive? Incrementally disruptive means that the, it's a change that would lead to a market disruption at the end. Let me give you an example. This is something like in the telecommunication. If we look at Zoom, uh, uh, Google, if we WebEx, what is happening with those? They are improving, improving, improving to the level that people will not anymore depend on um, a telecommunication. So for example, if people have networks with Etisalat, uh, they have with uh, Vodafone, they have with different uh, um, um, areas, um, the, the, uh, um, after the, the, what is happening in Zoom, uh, WebEx, uh, Google, and all of the other uh, possible um, uh, video conferencing tools, um, this is going to disrupt the telecommunication market because people will not depend anymore on the network that is provided by the local network provider when it comes to the telecommunication, they will only use maybe the, the 4G or 5G technology, um, uh, but, uh, but they will not make calls or send text messages via the normal telecommunication uh, network. Um, so the uh, um, the uh, Randa is asking if, if, if COVID digitization or digitalization will have the same impact. I think yes, uh, you are right, Randa. Because of the incremental disruption, you know, incremental disruption is basically like the frog um, experiment. You know, you keep on heating until the frog um, dies and the frog doesn't feel. So there is, there, there is a disruption in the, in the life of the frog, but it's done via incremental shifting. And this is what is happening in telecommunication. 
more and more people are using um, uh, Microsoft Dynamics, uh, the Microsoft Teams, uh, Zoom, and all of that. And people are less using telephone uh, communication, uh, landlines, and, and, and all of that. And this is, in a while, after a while, that's going to disrupt the telecommunication um, uh, strategy and products as well. Um, Ahmed is saying that this is good because it will end the monopoly uh, strategy. Absolutely. So what happens is that people um, can travel everywhere in the world and not use the local network. They can only use the local Wi-Fi if there is a Wi-Fi that is available um, in a shopping mall, on trains, on buses. Those are now um, uh, common uh, uh, things to see. And people can easily use those uh, in order to communicate and you will not pay a penny to the uh, local provider of the network, which will definitely change not only um, from a monopoly side, but also it will change um, the, the dynamics of the market itself, and it will disrupt the whole market um, in itself. Uh, Sam is saying that um, the technology is innovating the workspace um, and, uh, um, you know, the, in their organization, uh, they are working on a, on a even a future collaboration platform uh, for the full workplace so that um, this can uh, make enable people to work from home and uh, uh, you know um, enable to have a virtual office which is I think is very doable uh, Sam and uh, many people now are using Microsoft teams exactly in the same way and and I'm uh, I'm glad that there are local as well. Uh, trials to build something like that and, and I hope that this will succeed because at the end of the day it's in the benefit of the customer the more you have options like Ahmed Al Attar was saying the more you are fighting monopoly and also the more that the service by the way becomes better because once people compete on service levels uh, always the benefit is to uh, the uh, customers when we look at the um, cyclic innovation model uh, and, and how the uh, innovation has many facets. So when we look at uh, 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 some sides of innovation, um, the, the point is always innovation starts with what the customers need and what could possibly be the need of the uh, customer. So when we look at the uh, different intersections. So we have social innovation and we have business model innovation, technological innovation and scientific innovation. So many people think that innovation is always in the technology only. Technology is, a, is one side of innovation because of course that's something that many people are focusing on and it's very visible to people in the previous years. Well, because the technology um, is something that people focus on in the, uh, in the previous years. Since the iPhone has launched and people started using smartphones, smart devices, smart houses, smart vehicles, and all of that. So innovation was some si sometimes um, cornered in the uh, technology. Um, however, there are dif different uh, areas of, of innovation some of it are like social innovation, and we'll talk about that. Uh, business model innovation, which is uh, process uh, engineering and, uh, and uh, uh, different strategy models, change models, and this is uh, as well um, categorized as innovation. Scientific innovation in terms of the research and every time somebody um, does a PhD or researches uh, an area um, uh, that nobody has done before, this is called a scientific innovation. Why is that? Because it adds to the knowledge cycle. And we all know that PhDs and, and, and all of that, they all add into the knowledge cycle. So they are considered as scientific innovation. When it comes as well to um, improving the social capital, and we have spoken about the social capital uh, uh, before and how uh, the knowledge and skills of the society and networking and all of that, so that adds as well to the soft knowledge cycle and experience, which then um, adds to the networking and to the possible opportunities and cross country and cross border collaboration, um, improving the market cycle. And then this as well would help the engineering cycle in terms of the technology innovation. So if you can see that innovation has many sides and in order for innovation to really work and in order for innovation to um, um, uh, to be applied 
Um, there needs to be lots of collaboration, and this is what we will discuss uh, in a moment once we look at the model that Christensen has uh, suggested in his book, The Innovator's Dilemma. So the types of innovation are several. The um, nine types um, mainly are uh, looked at. Uh, some of it, like we mentioned, are related to um, uh, organizational services and business model, and some is uh, uh, related to the product uh, production and process uh, and, uh, and implementation, and some related to the thinking process as well. So when we look at the uh, most common types of innovation, the easiest one we know, of course, is product innovation. We also know uh, the, um, uh, the service innovation as well is when uh, people do a new service that is, um, uh, um, has not been offered before. Uh, something similar to that is now the delivery companies, for example, that are looking at um, uh, doing errands, running errands for people, doing the delivery. That's an innovation in the service. Product innovation, we have a lot of that, and I'm sure everybody has lots of examples of that. Um, uh, process innovation is um, when uh, the um, uh, business process re-engineering or innovation in terms of um, creating a new process that removes um, the uh, delays in the old process. Some of that, um, uh, for example, examples is uh, the implementation of e-verification of certificate. Uh, before, if somebody wanted to verify a certificate, they had to um, uh, uh, send a copy, write to um, a certain um, uh, organization, uh, and then get a feedback. Now, with um, a new uh, process that allows the uh, colleagues who want to verify a certificate to just go online, uh, type in the number, and get the certificate uh, verified online uh, directly. Uh, we have spoken about the incremental uh, um, innovation, and this, this is related, like we mentioned, to um, the telecommunication as an example. Um, also, there is um, the uh, business model innovation, where the organization delivers uh, uh, value in a different way. Uh, an example of that is the change in uh, the pain gain model. Uh, one of that is the Uber and Kareem and you know all of the um, uh, car sharing model. That's a completely new model which relates to the um, uh, uh, platform economy uh, and enables uh, uh, people to share in a completely new and innovative uh, business model. Disruptive is what um, uh, um, organizations like, for example, Elon Musk uh, and his organization are doing in terms of um, electric vehicles, despite they are vehicles in, in themselves. So if we look at the market, they are not really something new. It is a vehicle. However, um, they, uh, the, the, um, the idea of having the vehicle uh, run on uh, electricity is going to disrupt the oil and gas market because that's uh, something that um, was considered a primary customer for oil and gas. When all, if we can, if we look at theoretically, if all the vehicles run on electricity at a certain point, um, then uh, the market of oil and gas will be disrupted forever because not only uh, it is going to affect the petrol or the fuel, but also it will affect the engine uh, collaterals, which means uh, gearbox oil, uh, engine grease, and all of that, that is uh, secondary products that are used in a car. So that's also an example of that. Um, breakthrough innovation, innovations that generate a paradigm uh, shift. Uh, like, for example, the uh, transitors, and this is an example uh, uh, of how the, uh, um, the, the create a shift in the thinking uh, process as well. Um, uh, Randa is, is, is uh, commenting and also um, um, Ahmed. Uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the disruptive uh, change in the uh, electricity, uh, the electric run uh, vehicles or e-vehicles, um, like they call them uh, in, in the automotive sector. Um, Ahmed is saying it will reduce the travel cost. Um, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, yes, it, it, it should be, uh, of course, because running on electricity, of course, depending on the country, because in some countries, the electricity is more expensive than actually 
um, um, uh, refueling the vehicle. In other countries, it's the opposite. So it depends on the country. And uh, Randa is um, critiquing the point of uh, cost, yes, maybe, uh, but the human impact is missed. Um, I think Randa is also uh, maybe referring to the autonomous uh, driving. Um, Ahmed was saying for the uh, business model um, in terms of uh, the Uber and Kareem, maybe that's the, uh, the comment that Ahmed um, uh, meant. So uh, yes, uh, that, that could uh, be. And I think also the comment regarding the working from home. Uh, I, I, so, so that's the uh, uh, that's the the main comment that Ahmed maybe is referring to. Then we have organization uh, uh, innovation, where um, this is an innovation in the structure of the organization, in in managing resources, in managing demands, in in order to ensure that people are doing their jobs um, um, smoother, easier, which relates as well to process improvements and so on. Many of those innovations, even the outcome uh, driven. Many of those innovations are, you know, depending on each other and the, the you many, um, many times you find more than one occurring in the same organization. And that's why uh, what is very important about innovation and what many people do not realize about innovation is that innovation doesn't happen from someone alone, but it's a lot of collaboration between different people. And this is what we will see once we look into the innovation model and the innovation process. So it's time to look now at innovation process and how does the innovation work according to the uh, Christensen innovators dilemma. He explained it really, really well in, in this book. So when we look at the innovation process, it always starts from here. So the value configuration in terms of the markets, users and service, this is a point where all people who would like to have the um, innovation and they like to be innovators, they always have to look into what the market requires and what is needed in terms of solutions in the market. If there are required solutions and that's why when people start thinking with solutions, the innovation picks up the speed very quickly because people immediately need the product and they want to use it. Exactly like when iPhone launched the first touch phone and, and they called it the smartphone. People at that time, they were between using Blackberry and getting emails and all of that. And then all of a sudden, iPhone with a smartphone started looking at app, uh, apps, uh, um, you know, like uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook at that time and all of that. And they started making the user experience much more interactive and friendly. So the, the people were ready uh, to use it. But then when you are thinking of the value configuration, you will never do it alone. So what do you need to do is look at the value network in terms of who will help you do this. For example, when um, iPhone wanted to launch, when Apple wanted to launch iPhone, they have to find, they don't do everything alone. They have to find somebody who does the processor of the phone, somebody who is doing the screen of the phone, somebody who is assembling, you know, the, all the other parts like plastics, the headphones, the chargers, you know, all of that collateral um, and um, secondary products. So they have to look into that. So they have to look into uh, processors, uh, like we mentioned, screens and all of that. Then afterwards, they have to have a functional architecture. What does this mean? It means they have to organize everybody in terms of interfaces. How are they going to interface with each other? For example, if I'm getting um, uh, the, you know, a, a processor from China, and the screen is coming from uh, Malaysia and the plastic is coming from Brazil and you know all of those products I have to architect uh, everything and I have to design uh, the how are every um, uh, um, how will, will, will the value network collaborate together and how will they um, um, deliver to each other and, and how they will adjust all the um, uh, uh, the uh, specifications and the delivery dates and all of that um, together. 
Once I get all of that sorted, then I need to look at the financial model. How much does everything cost um, in terms of collaboration, shipping, registering IPs, and, and getting all of that done? So as you can see, somebody, and this is the challenge with innovation, that innovation, many people think that, you know, I will be innovative by, you know, just getting the idea. And once I get the idea, this is the bulb, you know, lighting up, and then I am the creative person and the innovative person. It doesn't work like that. Because if you get the idea that is really good, you have to test its value. This is all you. So maybe this is like you and uh, the market need. So that's like one person plus market research. You can do it alone. However, once you have the idea and you need to produce it, you need then to involve people who are going to help you. Even in the simplest idea, even if you are going to produce something that is very small, it needs packing, it needs machines, it needs people who are going to um, uh, fund, it needs a lot of things. Then those people have to be organized and the interfaces between all of them, they have to exist and you have to engineer it properly. And then once all of this is done, you have to check how much will this cost and then um, uh, uh, you know, getting everything uh, running. So um, Sam is giving an example in terms of, for example, banks, when they want to have cloud solutions. Um, that's a very good example, Sam. If I have here a cloud solution, I have lots of uh, value network. For example, I have to speak with Visa, MasterCard, American Express. Those are independent organizations that are not related to uh, the bank itself, but those are independent financial organizations. And then they have to speak together and then uh, also the in terms of the payment gates and portal because maybe the payment gate is offered by the local network which is it is a lot but i need to call uh, to coordinate with visa i need to coordinate with the local payment authorities with the central bank they need to monitor you know all of that needs to come along how will i engineer everything together and then how much will that cost because maybe i need to factor in um, 0.1% uh, here, 2% here, all of that in the price, and then the financial model will be ready. So you can see um, innovation doesn't work by just the normal, um, uh, uh, you know, I founded the normal uh, Isaac Newton uh, model of, of, you know, the apple and the tree. Uh, it doesn't work like that. Innovation needs a lot of collaboration with so many different people, and that's uh, extremely important. And that's why here, we have the triple helix model, which is in many cases, universities are going to offer uh, research and development. Business sector is going to fund and is going to um, apply the idea if it's commercially uh, feasible. And then the government is going to set the right policies and procedures in order to ensure that this um, um, uh, product is well tried and it's um, trusted and it's ready to be uh, implemented across different sectors and also offer the proper audit um, and um, uh, governance over uh, the process itself. Let's give an example, exactly like we mentioned here, a laptop. For example, a laptop might be made by uh, Toshiba, for example, or Dell or whatever, but then um, you know, the, uh, the disk itself needs to be brought from someone, the displays needs to be brought from someone, the microprocessor, um, uh, the thin film disk needs to come from someone else, software and, and other areas need to come from different areas. So as you can see, all of those are players in the network. And if just Toshiba says, I will do it alone, they, they, they need massive resources and most probably it will take them ages to do it. But what did Toshiba do? I will register my IP, I will register my intellectual property uh, rights, I will register my idea, but I will seek help from different people, Intel uh, um, uh, screens, uh, um, maybe I'll speak to even competitors. And we all know that for example, uh, Huawei, uh, uh, and you know the uh, 5G technology, they are offering a lot of the infrastructure in many organizations and in many countries um, uh, for in terms of the um, telecommunication infrastructure, um, uh, they are offering that already um, uh, in the background. So that is something that many competitors even are collaborating on 
because if uh, I don't care if you are my competitor as long as you are able to provide me with um, uh, uh, something that I need um, and uh, a component in my product that I require in order to perform uh, and to uh, for my product to see uh, light. It is very important then that this needs a lot of investments. And that's why many organizations and the uh, uh, Chris Tensen, even in his book, he looked at uh, the budgeting. And in order for innovation to happen, it needs a lot of resources. And the most common used model is the 70-20-10 rule. What is 70-20-10 rule? If we want innovation to see the light, it's very important that we budget for that. So the suggestion is, 70% of your budget, keep it on your core work, which is something that uh, you want to work to develop. So keep it, develop it, um, uh, you know, the, your core initiatives. So uh, exactly like, um, um, uh, let's say um, the uh, uh, Apple organization. So 70% of your budget, use it to enhance your current initiatives, which is the normal iPhone, the, the laptops and all of that. 20% in adjacent technology or adjacent initiatives. And those are related to uh, specific people and specific uh, audience like described over here. I'll give you an example. Um, so for example, the um, uh, designers uh, um, computers, the, the ones with very high specs for games, um, uh, many uh, organizations are doing this. Um, the uh, the um, uh, applications and, and developed ideas uh, for very specific industrial and um, educational uh, purposes. So those are, you know, like niche uh, products and adjacent. That's why it's 20% um, because you want to keep that market on. 10% is for disruption, which is basically when you want to absolutely do something completely out of the traditional uh, 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 expectation. And that is the high risk, high reward. This is actually where you want to completely invent or create something that nobody else has done. So the, um, uh, when we look at, um, at that uh, budgeting, that's very important because without proper resources, you will never be able to run research and development. And this is an enabler to the innovation process that is recommended by all the books that we have looked at. When we look at the lean um, uh, change, how to create the change and how the um, innovation is really dependent on lean thinking, because if we want to properly manage resources and if we want to um, find the right budget, and that's why when we are talking about budgeting here, 70, 20, 10, um, it is very important to look at the removing waste so that I'm able to save budget and I'm also able to save time and um, uh, implement new processes and new budgets uh, um, uh, in the same time. So when we look at, for example, um, and this is what the uh, Eric uh, Rees mentioned in his, uh, in his book, The uh, uh, Lean uh, uh, Entrepreneur, um, and the, uh, this, it's very important, and lean startups, um, it's very important to look at removing um, uh, the uh, waste in terms of transportation. And this, is, this was um, highlighted by the Kites and um, uh, continuous improvement uh, methodology. Um, also removing the budget spent on extra inventory, something that we are storing, but for no reason. And this is something that we need to manage. Um, removing motions and transportation, both of them relate to the uh, Kaizen and to the effective use of time and space in moving um, uh, things around. Waiting times, um, uh, which is the delays in the projects. Uh, how do we um, uh, decrease those delays and improve the efficiency of time used? And over processing, you know, this is, this is the business process um, engineering. Sometimes we we don't notice, but we review things uh, double, triple times, four times. It's very important that we adjust that so that we don't over process. And that again, related to efficient use of time and resources. Over production, sometimes we, we do that um, uh, and we produce things that are 
not required in the same quantity, um, thinking that we will need them um, uh, later. Um, uh, improving the quality control and reducing the defects because every time we are uh, producing something with a defect, we will have to do it again, which will waste time, resources, and um, uh, effort. And then uh, improving skills because all of that, if uh, we are improving skills, we can do more with less amount of uh, labor or resources. And this relates to using the team members in the best, according to the best capability and according to um, their top and their best uh, potential. When we look now at the uh, uh, change uh, challenges, why do people fail to change and why innovation is facing a lot of change across the world? The main reason is not having a market need and people sometimes do things that people do not want. And that's why if we go back into the model of Christensen, you know, it starts with the value configuration. You have, we have to look at the need for the market and why people need a product before we think of the, um, uh, you know, just moving forward with ideas, ideas. It's very important that the ideas have value and the users are requiring it. And that's why um, here the uh, biggest failure is that many people just get driven by their ideas, get driven by the passion behind I want my idea to see the light. I just want to implement something. But if people don't need it, then um, the, uh, um, the innovation doesn't work. And so many ideas have not seen the light. So many ideas have been buried under the ground because there were no users for it. And um, it was mainly done from the brain of one person rather than doing a collaborative act. And that's why um, it is really highlighted and all the authors have insisted that innovation and change is something that needs more than one person. It's not one person who's going to do the whole cycle, but more than one. And many people, unfortunately, believe that they can make the news and they really like to um, be famous. And they say, I don't want to involve someone else because I don't want anyone to take the light from me. And this is one, the, uh, one of the biggest challenge, challenges in innovation that people like to innovate to take the spotlight and they lose the purpose because you need to innovate to create value to the community and then you will need to collaborate. And this is very important that uh, uh, people are able to look into the um, uh, incremental innovation process because innovation just doesn't happen from one brain but more than once. And um, this is the problem when people believe and they perceive something that is untrue. And that's why actually many people, when we are looking at the innovation series, why did we include the Gestalt um, uh, methodology and why did we look into Gestalt, despite it's a psychology topic and it's something that could have been included with the psychology series, but because it's, re it's relating a lot to the perception and sometimes the innovators believe that they see something and they want to create it and they don't involve others with them. And what happens is that they fall into the trap of seeing something that even the users are unable to see and they would need to have a lot of clarity and a lot of marketing feasibility before they go ahead and do all the efforts to produce the product. So of course the Gestalt um, uh, concepts, it depends on uh, five, which is sometimes we look at the figure, the foreground and the background. Sometimes we close um, uh, um, uh, um, a shape that does not is not closed, but because we want to find something that has a meaning. Um, sometimes we look at similarities and we try to find patterns, although they were not meant to be um, uh, patterns. Um, proximity, when things are placed together, if we um, uh, sometimes look to them as forming a shape, sometimes they, it is yes, sometimes it's no. And continuous in terms of um, people always like, and the eye is, is more comfortable or compelled to look into um, the order of something. So they like to move from one spot to the other in order to follow a certain order or 
a pattern. And that's why when we look into how people innovate and uh, you know, it always starts with an assumption. And here the assumption is either supported or um, uh, you know, by um, someone who, is, who has really uh, uh, tried it, so then it is yes, warranted or unwarranted. So if somebody is, did not really try it, and sometimes it is a written um, um, uh, confirmation. So yes, it's sometimes explicit or it is only in the head of someone or in the thoughts and the uh, brain of the one who created Then it is implicit. So when we look into assumptions, it's very important. And this relates to critical thinking skills. It's very important when we look into assumptions to ask ourselves, is my assumption supported? Yes or no? Is it written? Yes or no? Because it might be a warranted, um, explicit assumption. So yes, a lot of people have tried it and it is really proven and, and, and. So it's a warranted, explicit assumption. So that's a very good assumption. Sometimes it's the opposite, which is unwarranted, implicit assumption. If it is an unwarranted, implicit assumption, so this means it is in the head of someone who thinks uh, it is correct, but we don't know if this is actually feasible or not. And an example of that is when we, you know, people make assumptions um, is when you look at tigers and cats. So, you know, they are from the same family and this is an assumption. So if tigers are killers, then cats may also be killers. So again, this is um, in the critical thinking skills, we always need to challenge the assumptions because the perception and assumptions are one of the biggest challenges of people that they either make them too confident in believing that something will happen or make them uh, too hesitant that something might not happen. And for that, the, uh, uh, the change uh, in itself started um, looking at the, um, uh, and this was one of the very nice books um, that we quoted, which is the uh, happiness hypothesis and how and why people are looking into the change as something that they are unable to achieve because mainly there are two areas in the um, innovation and the change mind which is the conscious and the subconscious and here um, the um, uh, the hypothesis says that sometimes the conscious wants to go somewhere but the subconscious doesn't want to move and insists on going the opposite direction. And the problem is when there is a distraction, then change can never happen. And that's why the um, concept here was direct an either, which is your conscious mind, motivate your subconscious and try to make a change and then make the, the, the path easier, which is remove all hurdles that you can find in front of you so that change can actually be implemented and happen how to give how to explain that here is a point of the mental direction of how people think in the majority of the cases and when we look into how uh, people are looking forward but they are driven by their mental direction because there is something that is called emotional energy and the emotional energy is what we um, uh, refer to here as the fuel that drives people to make a change or move forward. The emotional energy will either be high or low, and they will either be positive or negative. So for example, if I have a high positive energy, that's performance, which means this is the best area and this is exactly where the innovators and change leaders need to be there. So they need to have a lot of energy and a lot of positive energy. Oppositely, if you have a lot but negative energy, this becomes survival. So you have high energy, but you are exerting energy to run away from something. And when people are in the survival zone, it is very hard that they can innovate or create any positive change. What about people having low but positive energy? This is mainly the recovery zone, and this is where people are trying to uh, move one step ahead. So they are positive, they are recovering, 
and uh, that's they need a lot of encouragement and to in, so that they can improve the uh, energy levels and come into the performance zone low energy and negative this is when people give up this is the give up zone uh, you know it's uh, i don't have any energy anymore and i and it's all negative and i don't think that i will succeed i'm just giving up and this is the burnout when people just feel um the uh, uh the that there is no hope uh, to continue so in order for people to make a change in order for people to innovate in order for people to think forward we need to be somewhere here but of course best in the performance zone because when emotional energy is high and this is exactly what um, um, uh, people why people create a change and why people um, are happy it's all because your conscious mind and your subconscious mind are all thinking in the same direction going forward and if we are thinking so if you want to innovate let's say <clears throat> we have a scientist in the lab <clears throat> but if the scientist in the lab is really intelligent so his conscious mind is really strong and he wants to do the best however the emotional side and the emotional energy is in the survival zone so what will happen i would like to um, um, run away because I'm afraid of something that can happen to me. So the thinking process is not going to be a forward thinking, but mainly a backward thinking, which is survive something, get out of a certain situation so that I can uh, be better uh, in uh, the uh, future. And this is what, what has been suggested in terms of how we create incremental innovation and incremental change, which is it's always the power of something very small. <clears throat> Sometimes people think of innovation and creativity as something that needs to change the world. Although innovation doesn't need to change the world, sometimes it's something very small. Let's remember something. You remember when we spoke, um, uh, for those who attended this book with us, about the tuna boxes. So before the tuna boxes were, uh, or the tuna cans, um, you used to have a can opener in order to open the tuna can. What was an innovation? An innovation was to create a can that has a lid over here, and you can just open this lid, and, it, and you can open the can without having to open it with a can opener. Can you see this is something that is very small. You didn't innovate anything in the process of making the tuna, the, the uh, you know, creating a, ta um, a tuna can from, um, 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 a material that is uh, new and innovative, but you only created a lid over here, and this lid makes the can open by itself so that you don't need a can opener. That's innovation. And this is sometimes great success, and it's all about the um, small movements. In order for us, again, to move, we come back to the Gestalt uh, um, uh, cycle. We have internal challenges and we have to fight ourselves in order to think differently and in order to look um, and achieve and perform something that we really aspire in our lives. And we look into the Gestalt cycle of change, it starts with sensing that I need to do something. Like when someone is hungry, they feel I, I want to eat. So that's the beginning of an awareness and the um, uh, restraining loop or the breaks is the desensitization when someone gets used to something. But let's speak positive first. So the sensation is the beginning of the awareness. And many people don't think that they need to innovate. And we are going to discuss that in our discussion point after we finish the uh, session and the recording. Um, what are we missing in the innovation over here? Because this is something that we really, as a region, um, we really need to boost the innovation power. We really need to boost our IPs and intellectual properties. And when we think of that, where is it because of the awareness? Are we having um, lack of awareness? And this is one of the challenges. Are we desensitized? Are we getting used to not innovating? Is this something that is stopping us? Then after you, well, somebody feels that they are hungry, let's say, I'm, I'm just giving an example of the hunger because it's easier to uh, uh, imagine. Then I'm aware, so I'm aware I need to eat, and this is where the awareness comes in. And then I start moving 
to get something to eat, whether to buy or something like that, but I start moving and that's the preparation site. Then I actually go and buy something. So then, you know, this is where I act. Then I eat it and then this is where, you know, I meet my need. I feel satisfied because now I've filled my hunger uh, and this is the assimilation. And then I finished withdrawal, you know, like, and, and, and I let go. So when we look at creating change, there are a lot of accelerators and those are the ones on top. And there are a lot of break uh, areas and this is the ones, those are the ones on the bottom. And this is one of the things that when we think of innovation and what we need to boost innovation across our region, it's one of the, uh, um, uh, the areas um, that we need to look at. And um, engineer Abu Shawish is actually asking a very good question that we are going to start with um, the discussion. Uh, why are we missing uh, in, in, on innovation? And this is one of the, uh, of the uh, key challenges when we look at the global competitiveness index that is uh, provided by the World Economic Forum. And we look at the majority of the regional Middle East um, region countries. That's something that we are struggling with. And this is something that we really need to um, find a solution. And that's why we looked at uh, and we included the Gestalt um, uh, book with innovation and not with psychology, because we need to look at the awareness and sensation and the um, are people having the perception, the perception of innovation. Do we need it? Yes or no? Um, how do we improve that perception and how we improve that leap of faith? Because that's something that we really need to challenge and we really need to believe that we can do it. And the majority of people from the uh, region, when they travel to different countries across the world, um, they actually uh, become very successful and they have innovations and IPs registered under their names. So where is the gap here? And where, what exactly are we missing in order to move into people who are able to um, uh, innovate and create uh, inventions and, and also um, uh, be uh, um, uh, productive in terms of solving the needs of the society. Because like we discussed, innovation always starts with the value chain by looking into what the users need. We have lots of needs in our region. Why are we not doing something about it? Randa is saying innovations are not priorities. Yes, priorities to whom? And this is the question, Randa. Priorities to um, individuals or priorities to um, the schools or universities, or is it government priorities and budgets, or is it, what is it? Because it's very important uh, that we look into innovation as priorities for the society, because we have lots of needs in the society for innovation. And you know, innovation, like we discussed, it starts with looking at what the users need. So what the users need in every culture, there are different needs according to the, to the culture itself. So for example, when, while we are looking at cybersecurity and you know, all of the Visa, um, MasterCard, uh, American Express payment portal um, uh, needs for one country, in another country, they might not be at all at this level. And this is not an, an innovation need, but maybe an innovation need could be for them, transportation, uh, societal uh, challenges. So innovation depends a lot on the users. And that's why it's very important to have um, user uh, 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 point, uh, user um, um, focus on why, where we want to innovate. The last part, some tools for creative thinking and how to improve creative thinking. Of course, it's very important that, you know, the first point is the um, eagerness to explore. And this might answer the question that Randa has raised or, you know, we spoke about. We need people who are eager and hungry to explore. It's very important. Exploration is the beginning of, of innovation. Why is this happening? How can, I have, how can I help with it? And then discover something, which is how certain things happen. Then I design, and then I design a prototype, and then I deliver it, and then I see if it's working. 
and then I keep on, you know, thinking, designing, and, you know, going through the loop. So it's very important, you know, build, measure, and learn. It's very important for any um, uh, innovation to work. And as we know from a, from a thinking perspective, there are always two ways and two approaches of thinking. There is the deductive thinking and inductive thinking. Deductive is when I have a theory and I want to prove whether it is yes or no. So it's confirmation or denial. Inductive thinking is when I observe something and I would like to you know, create a hypothesis from my observation. And a lot of innovation, of course, comes from inductive thinking. Because this is where, from a certain observation, you believe that there is something that can happen. Exactly like when um, uh, uh, Apple created an iPhone where nobody has imagined that it, it didn't come from the norm. It, it came from a completely new con concept that was visualized by uh, um, someone in, 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 uh, in Apple where he observed that there is something this could be really appreciated by the users and then he created a hypothesis and theory and then he started working on that. So the importance again of going and observing and importance of looking into uh, the user's pattern and the user's preference so this kind of, of, of observation has been highlighted by the Japanese, where they form the um, uh, the uh, Ginkai Genbitsu, uh, where they looked at, it's very important that observe, observe, observe. It's very important that you go and observe. And this is coming from the um, uh, uh, area that, uh, and this, this then led to the Gemba that we will discuss in a moment, that, you know, on a railway, you cannot see after a certain point because then this is what they call the vanishing point. So what do they uh, um, say as a concept? Go and see and walk out of your designing lab or designing office and go and see the ob and observe yourself. And this is the concept of Gemba by the Japanese where they said, you know, break the chains, don't stay in your office, go and walk. Because the more um, you, you go and you observe people, you will understand trends, patterns, and this will give you ideas on how to create something and create a new solution that can be very beneficial to the users in your context, in your country, in your location, where you are. So they combined design thinking, lean, startup and agile diagram so eric uh, reese uh, design thinking and agile uh, diagram all in one so they said when you are focusing on the customer in the observation side look at you know empathizing with the customer understanding and defining and create an idea this is all in terms of your design thinking F because this is, what is the concept about design thinking it's all focusing on the customer the design thinking depends a lot on the customer, on the priorities of the customer. And this is what we need in every country. We have different priorities. Then once you understand that, you have to start producing. In order to do this, the lean startup, Eric here comes in. So you want to, um, you know, try something. So first you have to try, learn and then build prototypes, build second and third until you are able to build it right, measure, and then go ahead. Then in, when, once you are executing and you actually start producing in the market, you will need to have um, a proper agile production, which is basically in the execution phase, um, uh, product uh, backlogs and um, you know, the, in terms of um, production, uh, um, uh, capacity, uh, expectation, uh, quality control, and all of that. And this is something that you need to be agile with because every now and then you will have to make modifications and improve your production quality, quantity, uh, and also delivery uh, processes. That's why um, we need different hats. And this is the last point we'll discuss today. And this is where Edward Bono said, 
that in order for people to properly think, um, we in many cases need to wear different hats and we need to adjust our thinking process and reflection on different patterns. The first pattern is when we look at facts, um, then we look at emotions. And that's why even when you look at Lean Six Sigma here, it empathizes the first step because you need to understand the customer. And that's why Edward de Bono said, you know, look at your emotions. What do you feel? Some decisions, sometimes you have to take decisions with how do you feel about it? The benefit, and this is the thinking of the user. When you think of the user, what is the benefit? What is, and that is why when we looked at the innovation, it's very important that we relate the idea to a user experience, to a user benefit. It's very important to have that hat on. Ideas are going to be created with the green hat. I need to plan when I'm producing. And this is when uh, you, know, you look at the production phase over here. So we need the blue hat over here to plan. And then to make a call whether to move forward or not to move forward, we need the black hat and the judgment. So in a nutshell, what did we discuss today? We defined what is innovation and we have reviewed that innovation is a very important step for all the society and for um, the whole country and the whole nation uh, growth. And innovation um, depends a lot on not only one person, but you have to um, uh, collaborate with several people in order to create something that people use. And that's why we have the innovation process where we discussed the, uh, that it all starts with the user, the value chain, and then I need to look at who is acting in this, the actors that are going to help me in my uh, um, um, uh, project, like we discussed um, with Toshiba making laptops, despite they stopped now, but Toshiba making laptops, they need processors from Intel, they need software from Microsoft, they need maybe the keyboard and the plastic from a different company, the motherboard from a different one. And then you have to, ar to design the uh, architecture over here. So design the collaboration and interfaces between them. And then all of that will cost something. And this is where you need to make um, a calculation. And this is the innovation process that is designed by uh, Chris Tensel. Then we looked at the change challenges and we looked at how, why do people fail to make changes. We um, uh, discussed the switch by Chip and Dan Heath, who have referred uh, the, uh, to the elephant uh, uh, thinking, the conscious, the subconscious, and clearing the road uh, map. We also discussed some of the challenges of the gestalt thinking and the perception that many people have. Um, do they have the awareness? Do they have the right perception? Do they have the right uh, thinking process? Um, in terms of uh, creating an innovation. And then finally, we looked at some tools for creative thinking, um, and those are related to critical thinking method. The more we think inductively rather than deductively, that is going to answer the question of what happens, why, and that is the inductive way of thinking. And then we spoke about how we combine design thinking with Lean Six Sigma uh, or Lean uh, Startup and Lean um, uh, Entrepreneurship uh, moving forward. And then we looked at the six hats of Edward de Bono and why those could be a very important uh, tool to use for people to uh, improve and enhance analytical and critical thinking um, that we need in order to support and improve uh, engagement. Uh, uh, in innovation. So with that, we will uh, now stop the recording and then uh, open the discussion for the floor.